Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mortgage Guy podcast. This is Darian Newlick, your host. Very excited to be able to have you here and very excited to start with my first podcast here um, for the Mortgage Guy. My goal here for you is to be able with this series to go over guidelines for consumers to understand what a loan officer or a lender has to do to get them qualified and just giving you that education so that you understand what it is that you need to do or how to get qualified. It'll also help you when you go to apply for a mortgage or you're interested, then you already have a general understanding of how to go into that conversation, whether it were me or some some other loan officer with another company. The goal is to make sure that you're as informed as possible and there's nowhere better to start than by going over the guidelines for you. Because these guidelines are how a loan officer does their job, how an underwriter is going to view your file and what's required. So I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to focus on helping consumers, just like yourself, be able to go out and shop for mortgages or go to buy a home, refinance your home, whatever it may be, that you have the understanding for that. So today, our first topic is going to be over Fannie Mae. So just so you understand, there's many enti- or a handful of entities that insure loans. So these entities have set guidelines to what a loan officer must do or a lender must do in order to get you qualified, in order that we can deliver the loan and they will insure it or back that loan. So there is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are the conventional entities. And then there's Ginnie Mae, which has FHA, VA, and USDA loans. There are other places that you can get a loan from, which are called non-qualified mortgage products, as well. But the main one that we're going to go over here today, again, we're starting with Fannie Mae. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through the handbook and you will be able to walk with me on my YouTube channel. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit quicker through or more quickly through these pages, but I'm going over the key specific repetitive items that I see on a routine basis. I'm not going over everything because we would be here for hours on hours. But again, I want to go over the key parts that, again, I see regularly. So um, there are many sections. You can find the link to walk along with me um, in my YouTube channel uh, uh, in the comments or uh, description section below. But once you go there, I'm going to chapter B. Uh, the very first one, which is page 155 of the handbook. So if you actually look at the bottom, you would see page 155. If you're looking at my YouTube channel, you can see where I'm circling here as the 155. So there's many other sections. Basically, what it boils down to is those other sections are more lender specific. This section B is the key for borrower qualification and other related items that are good for you to understand and know as we are going to try to underwrite your loan and take that perspective when we go into getting you initially pre-approved, not just simply pre-qualified. So go here, section B, let's start going. So I'm going down uh, many highlighted areas and those are the ones that I'm going to go over. So first one, allowable age of credit documentation no more than four months old on the note date. So make sure your documents are no no more than four months old by the note date. So basically, what's the note date? That's when you close, okay? So by the time you close, I need to make sure when you sign that note and we file it, that your documents are not four months old. So we cannot have a pay stub that is six months from six months ago. That's just a great example. So. Go on down here, allow, allowable age of federal income tax returns. So as defined here, we're going to look here. So February 15th, 2020, 
most recent tax return would be 2018. Just a great example, April 17th, uh, 2020 would be 2019. December 15th would also be 2019. One key thing with tax returns, just so you're aware, it goes based off the file, the extended filing date. So you have until the extension to file your tax returns, which I believe is October 15th. And uh, someone could correct me if I'm wrong on that, on the exact extension with the IRS. I'm not 100% sure. I just know it is in October. So just so you're aware, if you were to file your, if we were to close your loan before October 15th, we'll just say October in general, you have to at least have the prior year's tax returns because you have not, you had the filed extension and you were able to close the loan within that extension or extended period. If you do go over, so for example, if this was December of 2020, we would need to have those 2019 tax returns. Here on the April 17th of 2020, you see 2019 because typically the initial date is supposed to be in March, I believe. Um, so whatever that is with the IRS, on that first date, if you do not get an extension, we would need to have 2019, for example, um, so the most recent year. So we're going to go ahead and keep moving on here. Uh, so scrolling on down, just kind of watching my screen as I'm going through here. So next section, we're going to go over, so occupancy types. Um, so Fannie Mae is for principal residents, so that's going to be your, your personal primary residence, uh, second homes or investment properties. As far as for the principal residence properties, you'll see in this table below what is classified as a principal residence, um, which means that is a property that the borrower occupies as his or her primary residence, clear, clear as day. Multiple borrowers, um, this is a good one. Only one borrower needs to occupy and take title to the property. Typically, we're gonna wanna see the primary borrower, not the co-signer or guarantor on there um, as the one occupying the property. So make sure that's the primary. Um, parents, here, here's a good one. Parents are legal guardian wanting to provide housing for their handicapped or disabled adult child that is okay if the child is unable to work, they don't have sufficient income, qualify for the mortgage, the parent or legal guardian is considered the owner or the occupant. And then child, children wanting to provide housing for parents. So if the mother or father needs a place to live or they want to move and they want to now consolidate, live together, if the parent is unable to work or does not have sufficient income to qualify for a mortgage on his or her own, the child is considered the owner occupant. All right, so to move on here, down to second home properties. Uh, so as far as you see here, requirements. So if you wanna buy a second home property, so this is like a vacation property. This isn't a property down the street. So if you lived in a property in a normal neighborhood, for example, we'll just say, um, just like your typical Pulte, Lennar, whatever type of neighborhood you want to picture, and then you want to buy a home down the street, you can't classify that as a second home just because you want to put down less money. It has to be in a vacation spot. That is allowed by the lender to use just basic reasoning. So as a lender, if I look and I saw... For instance, I live in Indiana, and I saw that you wanted to buy a home down the street in Indianapolis that is clearly not a vacation spot. If you were living in Indiana, but you wanted to buy a home in Florida, it doesn't matter where in Florida, that can be considered vacation because of just the general area. So just keep that in mind. Uh, must be occupied by the borrower, by the borrower for, the, for some portion of the year, so you do have to live there. There is no way of really proving that uh, on a purchase. Uh, is restricted to one unit dwellings. So you can't have a two or three unit like a duplex. Must be suitable for year round occupancy. So it has to be great condi or good condition. Borrower must have exclusive control over the property. Must not be rental property or a timeshare arrangement. Not that you can buy a timeshare with a mortgage. And cannot be subject to any agreements that give a management firm control over the occupancy of the property. So the HOA can't 
retain the property for any reason or, or obtain control when you buy it. So investment properties, an investment property is owned but not occupied by the borrower. This can be any property that is, for example, let's say you had your home development, you want to buy a home down the street, doesn't matter if it's Indianapolis, doesn't matter if it's Cleveland, Ohio, does not matter. You can go ahead and buy that property as well as long as you meet the guidelines. So we're going to scroll on down here. So under sales price and appraised value used by DU, so DU's desktop underwriter, if you see that repetitively, that's the system for Fannie Mae, their automated underwriting system. So just so you know, I highlighted this sales price appraised value as it uses to calculate LTV or loan to value, combined loan to value, total loan to value. If you buy a home and your appraisal comes in above the sale price, it's the lesser of, it's the sale price. And you just, you're in good shape, you have some equity. If your appraised value comes in lower than the sales price, again, lesser of, we have to use the appraised value. Example, home appraised at 99,000 and the sales contract was for 100, you will be able to finance 5%, 3%, whatever it may be of 99,000 and you'll have to bring an additional 1,000 unless you negotiate that down with the seller for that $1,000 and bring down that purchase price. Loan level price adjustments. So loan level price adjustments, these are based on credit score, property, various items. So just so you understand, if someone has a 620 credit score versus a 740, you're going to see they're going to have different pricing. So loan level price adjustments is what that is called. So if, if someone asks me, I see X, X friend of mine got a 2875 with zero points, but how come you're showing me 3.125 with zero points? That's not the lender, that's the loan level price adjustment. There's other factors that can go into that, but that's the biggest key. From lender to lender, you're really looking at a difference of about a half percent in interest rate across the table. There's some that might be very, a very few amount might be a little bit higher, might be a little bit lower, but it's about a general half a percent only across the board once you get down to the nuts and bolts of the loan if it were go down, going to go down to closing and you actually pull out the real numbers at that point. So loan level price adjustments though, you'll see here. So if you were 620 to 639, Fannie Mae will not do under 620, but 620 to 620, 639, you'll see different down payment amounts or loan to values. So you put down 40%, 30%, 25%, 20%, so on and so forth. You would see this amount that is added to the rate that the FFIEC publishes every week and then Fannie goes and sets their pricing on that and then the lender set their pricing on that and then you have this. This is part of what Fannie puts together. This is what part of what all entities put together. But you'll see this is part of that. So this is something just for you to reference. You can also go here. You can click on this link right here, loan level price adjustments. There's adjustments for credit score. There's adjustments for type of property. Those are predominantly the main two. Also, loan to value has a, de a deciding factor in there as well. So go ahead, browse, browse through that as you want. I'm going to move on. So going to go on, keep moving through. Now, most of this, we don't really need to, don't really need to know this. A lot of this doesn't pertain to you. Um, here we go. Here's the next one. General purpose, general purchase transaction eligibility requirements. Okay. A, a purchase money transaction is one which the proceeds are used to finance the acquisition of a property or to finance the acquisition and rehabilitation of a property. That just means you can also do a renovation loan. Sweet. But if we look down here, here's the general requirements. The minimum borrower contribution requirements for the selected mortgage type loan type must be met. Proceeds from the transaction must be used to finance the property, rehabilitate the property, convert interim construction loans. So if you're doing, if you're going to do a bridge loan through like a local bank, and you needed to convert that to permanent financing. Bam. So that's when it kicks over into a 
traditional mortgage. Pay off the outstanding balance on an installment land contract or contract for deed. Next one, the only one I'm going to go over in this section is reimbursement um, for borrower's overpayment of fees and charges. So proceeds from the transaction may not be used to give borrower cash back unless it's for reimbursement for the borrower's overpayment of fees and charges. Let's say you put down $40,000 on your earnest money for whatever reason, and at the end of the day, you ended up needing $35,000. Or uh, a great example would be you go to wire funds before closing to ensure that they got their title balanced there after those fees for the final fees to come out. You get your, your final closing CD. We then go ahead and tell you, hey, here's the exact amount you need, and it was 5000 less than whatever you wired. You would be able to get that money back. Again, typically that's more you're going to get that back from title because title exchanges the funds. But in that instance... Again, you're allowed that reimbursement for overpayment. Fannie Mae will allow you to go up to 97% or 3% down in situations, certain situations, depends. There's many that many factors that go into that. Closed loan to value could be up to 105. So if you had a subordinate lien, you can go up to 105 if it qualifies with Fannie. Up to 30 years. So if you are a first-time home buyer doing a standard conventional Fannie Mae product, you can put down 3%. But if you have if you have purchased before or have not, but you fall in these income uh, these income <clears throat> oh boy, these income limits. All right, there we go. Then you could do the home ready program through Fannie Mae. And they give you an incentive on your interest rate, on your mortgage insurance, and on the rate pricing. So that is more beneficial to go that way. You do not have to be a first-time home buyer. You just have to meet the income limit requirements. If you go to Google and just search home ready income limits, you can search the area, uh, whether it's a town or city, and it will give you that income, that income limit for home ready. So I would definitely definitely consider going to look into that. Again, first-time home buyers on a standard program, if you're over that income limit, then you could do 3% down. I will say it's really hard if you are under a 740 credit score and you have less than 20% down and not a lot of money in the bank, you're probably not going to get qualified for that first-time home buyer 3% incentive. It's very hard to get done. I've been able to get some of them done myself, but again, it's not an easy one. So we're going to go here, non-arm's length transactions. Just moving on. This is a transaction on a purchase in which there's a relationship or business affiliation between the seller and buyer of the property. Fannie Mae does allow this. There are certain criteria around that. The, the key one here, I do like this, is for the purchase of a newly constructed property, if the borrower has a relationship or business affiliation, any ownership interest or employment with the builder, developer, or seller of the property, Fannie Mae will only purchase mortgage loans secured by a principal residence. Okay, so it has to be your primary residence. It can't be an investment property. And if Fannie Mae... And Fannie Mae will not purchase mortgage loans on newly constructed homes secured by a second home or investment property if the borrower has a relationship or business affiliation with the builder, developer, or seller of property. There you go. So they won't do investment. They won't do second homes as far as building. Purchase of pre-foreclosure or short sale properties. So basically, borrower may pay fees, assessments, or payments in connection with acquiring a property that is pre-foreclosed, short sold, and that are typically the responsibility of the seller or another party. So beware, I highly recommend do not buying a foreclosed or short sold property because you're going to have to pay additional fees. I mean, if you have the money, you get a great deal. I get it. But in most instances, the property has been vacated for some time or whatever it may be. Clearly, the sellers don't have money, so they can't afford to pay whatever it is they need to pay. But you will be potentially responsible 
for short sale processing fees, as you see there. Payment to a subordinate lien holder. Why would you want to pay that? And payment of delinquent taxes or HOA assessments. There are additional requirements here that may apply if you want to look more into that. Next, we're going to go over here. We're going to go to limited cash out refinance. What's a limited cash out refinance? This is just a refinance where you're not taking cash out. Or you can get a small amount of cash, which is 2% or up to $2,000. So if your loan amount is $100,000, you can take out 2% or $2,000. But if your loan amount is $200,000, you can only take out 1% or $2,000. So just something to keep in mind. Must meet the following requirements. You're, you're going to pay off your existing firstly mortgage. You can include a HELOC or a, or a second mortgage if it was used to pay off or to purchase the home. If you bought the home and two months later went out and got a HELOC to re-get cash back from your down payment, we can't pay off that HELOC. So that may disqualify you. It may be something that you're not going to be interested in. It could cause problems because the lender has to be able to reach out to that company for that subordinate lien, mortgage, line of credit, whatever it may be. And that company has to be willing to subordinate and they will give a list of requirements back to us. So if we are going to subordinate, it's very tough. It's kind of annoying, not fun to do. It is possible I've done it before, but it could really hold up your process. So just something to keep in mind. I'm going to go ahead down here. You can go up to 97%. Yay. That is not a first time refinance incentive. You can always go up to 97% in any scenario on, a, on this type of refinance. So not a cash out, but a, they, cut, they call it a limited cash out. Woo. <laughs> now we're going to go on down here. So with that 97%, it has to be owned or, secured or securitized by Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae has to own the mortgage. Same thing here, CLTV up to 105 if the second mortgage qualifies up to 30 years. One unit principal residence must occupy the property. Manufactured housing is not permitted unless property meets the manufactured housing advantage requirements. I don't know much about manufactured housing. I'll be honest, it's not a forte of mine. But at the same time, there you go. Ineligible transactions, no outstanding first lien on the subject property except for single closing construction to permanent financing transactions. The proceeds are used to pay off a subordinate lien that was not used to purchase the property. The borrower finances the payment of real estate taxes that are more than 60 days delinquent. Cannot do that. Short-term refinance mortgage loan that combines the first mortgage and a non-purchase money subordinate mortgage. So you did not use that HELOC to buy the home. It's basically the same thing up there. Acceptable uses, you can modify the interest rate, paying off the unpaid principal balance. For the most part, if you're doing this loan, cut and dry, you're lowering your rate, you're reducing your term, doing a combo of both, whatever it may be, you're just, that's how your loan's gonna be structured. There's really not a whole lot to it. So don't go, don't want to get too far into that. Cash back to borrower. Again, you can get up to 2% or 2,000, the lesser of. Documentation requirements. When you're treating a transaction as a limited cash out refinance transaction, we must document all proceeds of the existing subordinate lien were used to fund part of the subject property. So we will make you prove that that, sub, that subordinate lien was used to pay towards that purchase. We, I have come across many, many home buyers looking 
to, or I shouldn't say home buyers, already current owners trying to refinance their property. And they took out a HELOC in the same month that they closed. And it looks like it was used to purchase the property. They told me it was used to purchase the property. And when we pulled up the documentation, it did not close for over a 15, 20 days until after the property was already closed on. It was just them getting their money back. So we will make you prove that. Existing subordinate liens that will not be paid off when a new limited cash out refinance transaction will not satisfy existing subordinate liens. The existing liens must be clearly subordinate to the new refinance mortgage. Must clearly be subordinate to the new refinance mortgage. The refinance mortgage must meet Fannie Mae eligibility criteria for mortgages. Basically, your loan to value has to be fine for that to qualify. And the subordinate lien has to qualify as well. And again, that's just a pain in the butt. That's hard to get done. Really hard. Um, dealing with another company, it's like they have their own process behind subordinating that mortgage, which takes a while. I've never seen anyone do it fast. If you find someone, let me know. Refinances to buy out an owner's interest, that's an acceptable, acceptable reason. So if you want to buy out someone, great example here, divorce. That's th This is the main reason why someone does this. Divorce, settlement, or dissolution of a domestic partnership. I have not seen it for any other reason. I'm sure you could probably do it in certain business instances, but that's the, that's the main one. Let's go down through here. We're going to go on to the next one. This is cash out, I believe, cash out refinance transactions, eligibility, pay off existing mortgages, pay off lines of credit. doesn't matter what type of mortgage it is. Pay that off, get cash, pay off debt, whatever you want to do with that cash. Really, it's up to you. There are some, some states that have certain requirements, but for the most part, you can do whatever you want with that cash. It just has its own LTV requirements tied to it. Ineligible transactions, more of the one to look at. The mortgage loan is subject to temporary interest rate buy-down. That's a future buy-down, not available. Subject property was purchased by at least one borrower within six months. So you cannot do a cash out or a any refinance with Fannie Mae less than six months from when you purchased it. Not when you did your last refinance, but when you purchased it. When you buy a property, you have to be on the deed for six months in order to refinance. If you refinance, you can refinance with a different lender almost immediately. Probably would not want to do that. But if there was some crazy change in the market, you would be able to refinance sooner than six months. As long as it wasn't the purchase date on the prior transaction or a purchase on the prior transaction. Acceptable uses, paying off unpaid principal balance, financing payment of closing costs, standing subordinate mortgages, equity for whatever the purpose may be, financing a short-term refinance loan that combines a first mortgage and a non-purchase money, subordinate mortgage into a new first mortgage. So you're basically taking like your line of credit and your primary mortgage and combining them into one. All same stuff. I'm not going to go over the delayed financing. That's not a common one. Student loan cash out refinance. There's some specialties to this. Nothing crazy. It will basically trigger a code in the DU findings, which give you a small incentive. It's not. It's not anything to really talk about. But this this part right here, that two percent or two thousand dollars, the lesser of. That's right there. That's not just for this transaction. That's for all limited cash out refinance transactions. Just so you know. Scroll on. Keep going through. Good thing is a lot of the stuff still is more lender based. But we'll go here. So loan amortization types. This just tells you there's fixed rate loans. There's adjustable rate loans. Not going into adjustable rates. It is not a common mortgage. If you are doing an adjustable rate mortgage today, call me so I can put you onto a fixed rate mortgage. Because right now in this market, you'd be crazy 
to do an adjustable rate mortgage. The rates are higher than fixed rate mortgages. The only reason that they're good is, number one, the rate has to be lower than fixed. And it's got to be incredibly lower because what if you stay in the home past that adjustment, that initial adjustment period? You don't know. So for me, you could be different, but if you're going to stay in the home, you think three years, I'm sure there's thousands of Americans out there who have thought that and end up staying in their home for seven to 10 years. And they could have done a fixed rate mortgage, but now they're suffering through that adjustable rate, constantly fluctuating, not fun. It's only fun when it goes down. That's not common. Let's be honest. Provisions for temporary interest rate buy-down plans. So I just highlighted this portion specifically, does not exceed 3%. You'll see it again once or twice, I believe. When you go to buy down your interest rate, there's some people out there who want to spend the most amount of money they can to get that lowest interest rate. They don't care if it costs costs them ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. They want that low interest rate. They see the benefit of it. They're going to stay in the home. Their plan is to stay in that home for the rest of their life. Or at least 15, 20 years, whatever it may be, some long, long period of time that they would clearly recoup that cost. There is a maximum amount that you can do. It's basically 3% of the total loan amount that a lender can charge in their origination charge, any fees in general, so a credit report, flood cert, technology, whatever fees they charge, and then also those rate points, a total of 3%. There is a 2% add-on if certain criteria is met. It's not all the time, but that is something that could help you if you want to go lower. Just depends on your loan, the structure, your rate, I mean, your credit, (laughs) even the loan to value, many things that go into that. All right, loan limits defined. Just know that there are loan limits for every county of every state. There's A set loan limit, I believe it's 548 currently, might be a little bit higher. I know it got adjusted recently. And then there's high cost. You'll find that like New York City, Los Angeles, other areas, you'll see it up to seven, eight, even 900,000. You'll see that high, high loan amount, which is a non-jumbo. So it's not as good as the standard regular transaction. It's not terrible though. It's probably only a quarter of a percent difference, which is great. And you can buy a $700,000 home without having to do a jumbo, which as we, anyone who has experienced a jumbo can be done in 30 days, but not all the time. It is a longer process typically. So there are low limits going on. Again, there's that 3% of the total loan amount. Cannot exceed that. Here we go. ATR. So that's where it says Exempt loans, if your loan is exempt, you can get 5%, so that additional 2%. Pass this up. Here we go. Special assessments, sufficient deposits to pay them will be collected as part of the loan amount. What am I talking about? I am talking about liens for taxes, special assessments, and liens that are not yet due and payable. If you have any sort of lien on your property... When you go to close, there might be a lender out there, but I'll say all lenders that are being compliant, legal, they're going to make you pay those off. Almost every single one. You have a tax lien, bam, you have to pay it off at closing or before. Some will do at, some will do before. That's 50-50. Whatever it may be. All right. Modified loans. Just to let you know, if your loan is modified, we need to get that new modification agreement, and that's what we go off of. We don't go off of your credit report. We don't go off of what it says. We can, we will still need to get your mortgage statement. Take a look at that, but we need those modification those modification documents to see 
if there was any addition, any amount that was put onto the back end of your loan, if you were going to pay your home off in 30 years, or we'll just call it at that point, 25 years left on the term, but at the end you owed $20,000, your loan was modified, bam, you have to include that in the refinance. It can't stay on that back end. Sometimes that's a little hard for people to get. Sometimes it's really not that beneficial to lower the interest rate and include that. Just depends. So something good to go over with you. First mortgage lien position. These are basic le legal requirements. It has to be a first mortgage. Okay, can't do a second mortgage through Fannie Mae. Or actually any of them, any of them for that matter. Always has to be a first mortgage for any entity. FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie, Freddie. Personal property may not be included. There you go. Can't include your jewelry. It's going to go on through here. Most of that stuff is ancillary, not very common. Escrow account, you can either have one, you could waive it. Basically, the criteria for that is if you put down 20% or not. You don't always have to include both taxes and insurance if you put down less than 20%. If you did not know that, you do typically have to include at least in insurance, but you do have options. Scrolling on, good thing is, is going on to general borrower eligibility. So are you eligible? If Fannie Mae purchase and securitizes mortgage, mortgages made to borrowers who are natural persons. You have to be a real person. And reach the age. You can't be 17. You can't be some person on a piece of paper that no one knows and really no identity. You kind of just made them up. Got to be a real person. There is no maximum age limit, so you could be 95 and do a Fannie Mae mortgage. Borrower identity. Borrower is any applicant, individual, or jointly whose credit is used for qualifying purposes to determine ability to meet Fannie Mae underwriting and eligibility standards. Co-borrower is a term used to describe any borrower other than the borrower whose name appears first on the note. All right. Pretty cut and dry. Non-U.S. citizen. There's a lot of, there's a handful of requirements around this. But if you are not a U.S. citizen, you're a permanent resident alien, you can actually buy a home with one year of just standard income. But from a documentation standpoint, it depends on your, where you came from, the classification, on your authorized work card. You need to get all, that, all those details. Limit to your number of properties. If you're buying your principal residence, you can only have one principal residence at a time. You can't have nine principal residences. Now, if you're going to do a second home or investment property, you can have up to 10. Beautiful. One to four unit. They're going to go off of the total number of properties financed. They give some. If you're jointly in the co-borrowers on there, they're only going to count it once, not twice. Common sense. There's a lot of common sense here. Following property type, the following property types are not subject to these commercial real estate. Multifamily property consisting of more than four units, timeshare, vacant lot, manufactured home on a leasehold estate, not titled as real property. So not your standard type of home. Reserve requirements are sometimes needed on certain loans. You can have a guarantor or a co-signer on your mortgage. Some, uh, some programs require home ownership, education, and housing counseling. Not all. Typically, if you're just doing a home ready, that's where you'll find the housing counseling. Not common anywhere else. Property eligibility, first lien, one to four unit, a lot of the same stuff. Residential in nature has to be real property. If it's in a flood zone, needs flood insurance, safe and sound, structurally sec secure. You can have your property not pass an appraisal. 
if it's not structurally sound, if it's falling over, ongoing renovations, they will mark it as subject to those being completed. Depends on the property. I would say review it with an out, uh, an outside appraiser. That's a great idea. You can also contact a loan officer, make sure they've been doing this for a while. So <laughs> you're not going to the first guy who just wants to get your loan through and hopefully it works. That happens too. Has to be legally a, resi a residential property readily available or re readily accessible by roads, served by utilities that meet standards. So just depends if it's rural, there's you know gonna be wells, septic, that's as long as it's community standards suitable for year round use, Except, acceptable dwelling types, detached garage. So a home that's detached from any other home, just sits by itself, attached, townhome, condo, semi-detached, whatever they classify that as. PUD, so planned urban development. That's where you see those builders, homes up, starting at 200,000. Ineligible properties, vacant land, properties not accessible by roads, agricultural, farms, con condo co-op hotels, boarding houses, bed and breakfasts. Can't do that. Nope. No here, says Fanny. We ain't doing that. Modular homes, just so you know, they right there. Not considered manufactured housing is eligible under the guidelines for one unit standard property. You're good. They have some have some requirements here. Classified as real property, conform to all local building codes. But you're good if you're modular. Very basic stuff. But for the most part, a lot of people don't understand or they don't know that. That's, a, that's actually a big one. Accessory dwelling unit. Just know with Fannie, you can have an accessory dwelling unit. This could be like, I have uh, an additional unit on my property. I would just like to say that's got to be 1,200 square foot or half the property, property, the main home square footage, whichever is less. Beautiful. Moving on down here. A lot more stuff that really is not all that needed. Um, this goes into more of just underwriting, the underwriting characteristics of the loan or of, of the loan process. Income validation, there's a, you have to actually get a report from your employer that you currently work there, what you make, tax return transcripts, retirement, social security, self-employed, need all that. Now, when we go through here, some risk factors, just so you know, credit history, delinquent accounts, installment loans, revolving debt, public records, foreclosures, collection accounts, inquiries that you have. There's a lot of risk factors that come into play with your credit, loan purpose, loan term, amortization types, occupancy type. Again, there's a lot of risk factors in here. There's a lot of money being lent. This isn't a car loan. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in most case. In most cases, to over, I believe it's over two hundred thousand is the average is more than the average purchase price for most states. Not more than it is. To, it's over two hundred thousand is the average for most states. I'm sorry about that. Installment loans. Just one key thing: if the loan is in your name or jointly, but someone else has been paying it from a secured account, like a checking account, a savings account, and they pay every month for at least 12 months, and we can prove that, then we can remove that from it being your debt. Public, rec public records, foreclosures, collection accounts. Oh boy. If you have these, get them resolved before you even come talk to anyone. Get them resolved. We don't want to see that. If you have significant collection accounts, we don't want to see that. That's bad. But if you have a charge off, a charge off means that you no longer owe that debt. A lot of lenders will tell you to pay that off. Guess what? You don't need to pay that off. It's charged off. 
It's not yours. They're done. Don't worry about it. It just, it will affect, I mean, it's a risk factor. <laughs> you let that deck go. Certainly you have to meet the deck and the debt to income requirements. We'll go over variable income when we get to the income section. You have to have an approved eligible recommendation. There's some that will, there's some lenders out there who will do a manual underwrite, but it is not a common thing. You're not going to find a lot of lenders willing to do manual underwriting on conventional loans. You're going to find them approved eligible or it's just a no go. There are some lenders, I don't know who they are, but some are willing to manually underwrite that loan. Typically companies with higher rates will have that, more of that higher of that 0.5% scale because most of their business is going to be harder loans to get done. But at the same time, approve eligible recommendations is going to be where you want to be. Uh, it's very hard to find a lender who is willing to do manual underwrite. Again, there are some out there, so I don't want to say it's not possible. It is possible. There are companies that will do that. It's not common. And I don't know exactly what the terms would be on manually underwritten loans, what those rates look like. Look at that LLPA sheet, loan level price adjustment sheet. There may be something on there regarding that. All right, let's move on. Going through here, prove eligible. That's the big thing. Moving on, moving on. Again, all stuff typically more for, from an underwriting processing standpoint. Red flags, just know on your credit. If we have fraud alerts, when there's a data or when there's a ver all the verifications are run, a big one is data verify and your information is ran and there are past items that you did not disclose. That's a key reason why loans get held up. Someone had a past foreclosure that they didn't tell us that didn't show on their credit. That happens. And then the realtor's mad at us. Everyone's mad at the loan officer. Oh no, you bad guy. But it was never disclosed. Sometimes it was never asked. So that's also on the loan officer. But, you know, potential red flag. We're looking out for those. That's, a, that's more of the key one though. The fraud alert on the credit. It's a big one. Certain discrepancies with the application as well. So now we'll go through here. Stable predictable income. That's your standard W-2 40 hour a week, salary, you're fine, no issue. Variable income, fluctuating hours or income that includes commissions, bonuses, overtime, the, this, this income varies. You don't get the same commission amount every single month. You typically don't get the same bonus because it's based on performance in most cases. Rants, some very, very slightly few will give you a guaranteed thousand dollar bonus a year over time, that's never going to be the same every single time. So it's a two years or more of receipt, 12 to 24 may be considered, depends on the situation. Then you have to look at trending income. Is that income in the current year? We're going to look at the past two years, 12 to 24 months. But if we're looking two years plus, so we have past two years, your current year has to be on pace with the prior year. If you had all of 2020, a tiny portion of 2019, we're going to use the most current full year, divide that by 12, and then look at what you're trending. If you're trending lower, we're using your current income for this year. If you had two prior years, we're doing the average or the current year, whichever is less. Keep that in mind. Continuity of income, you need to have a three-year continuance, but... There's some expirations that are not defined and there's some that are defined. So that's where you have to look. Again, if you're looking with me, this is page with 316. These defined expiration dates, these ones are not defined. If it's not defined, you're fine because there's no way to prove how long you will receive those for. The defined ones, they do have proof. So make sure to look into that if that pertains to you. Verification for non-U.S. citizen borrowers. 
So this is from an income standpoint, salaried commission borrower. You're looking at all the same stuff for the US. I will say I did have someone who filed income, foreign income. So they're a resident here. They're considered a resident in the country. And what they did was they filed foreign business, a foreign business income. Uh, I forgot the page with the IRS. I forgot the tax return page. But when you file that, there are certain criteria on there that it depends on how we could use or classify that income. Because basically, if you are from an, if your income's in another country, you're not getting taxed properly in many instances. So you need to have your American tax. Or in other words, what I would do, if you're looking to buy a home in the States and you're not looking to go the non-QM route, you're looking to go a Fannie Mae standard better term loan, better rates, better terms, then you're going to want to just file a Schedule C. You can do that with foreign income. It's basically 1099. It's treated the same. So if you want to buy a home in the States with better terms, make sure that you file a Schedule C with that income. Otherwise, this gets a little tricky. Just to keep that in mind. Non-taxable income. If your tax-exempt status, you can do 25% of the non-taxable portion. 25% of any portion that's non-taxable. That is for Social Security, child support, workers' comp benefits, certain types of public assistance programs, food stamps. Yes, you can use food stamps. I have before. Employment documentation provided by the borrower. W-2s, tax returns if you're self-employed, business returns if you are, if you own a your own business outside of just a standard Schedule C small type type company, it's typically contracted work, 1099. We're talking like you're the owner of some like Pepsi Cola. You're filing a schedule, typically a partnership return, I would assume, but partnership or S corporation, sole corporation, S, sole. There you go. And we have to get your K-1s. Some instances we need bank statements. Depends on the program. Fannie Mae usually requires two most recent months. A lot that's involved with income if you're looking at like social security, award letters. A lot of different forms of income out there. But if you're just W-2, just send me over your last two years of W-2s, your most recent pay stub, please. Thank you. Call it a day. If you have other questions about income, just let me know. Feel free to drop a message to me in the comments or send me an email. I'd be glad to answer that. Base pay, hourly, bonus, overtime income. I mean, all that's going to be calculated very typical. Salaries just divide it by 12. Hourly times your hours times 52 divided by 12, 52 weeks a year. Make sure you're on pace with last year. Bonus to your average, overtime, same thing. There are some circumstances. Again, we can do less than to your average, depends. Military income. So military personnel may be entitled to different types of pay in addition to, the, in addition to their base pay, flight or hazard pay, rations, clothing allowance, quarters allowance, and pro, proficiency pay are acceptable sources of stable income as long as the lender can establish that the particular source of income will continue to be received in the future. Typically would need to have something in writing from DFAS or someone over there to share with us that that will continue. Commission income, two years, 12 to, 20 more, 12 to 24 months may be considered. Kind of see that as the, the standard. Same thing with secondary employment, no less than 12. Can't have less than 12 months. Verification of seasonal income, two years. There is no exception to this. You need to have two years if you're using seasonal income. Um, just know if you have secondary employment. So like the key thing is a lot of times you're going to see the lender requiring that you have those two years of ha of holding two jobs because that's tough. They want to see you hold the two jobs for two years. Again, in some instances, 
You can do it a little bit under. It just depends on the lender. That's uh, more of a lender discretion. Go through here. Those are, those are the key points on the income side. Eligible properties, we've already gone over that. Two to four principal residence, one to four investment. But if the borrower occupies one of the units as their principal residence, you're fine in the two to four. You can certainly do a one unit, duh. Ineligible properties, if you are using rental income for the borrower's principal residence, okay? A one unit principal residence or the unit the borrower occupies in a two to four unit property or a second home cannot be used to qualify the borrower. Can't use income from the second home that you have for vacation. Can't use that to qualify. General requirements for document documentation of rental income. Schedule E, fully, fully executed, executed lease agreement on purchase transactions, refinance transactions, which the borrower purchased the rental property during or subsequent to the last tax return filing. So if you had filed your tax returns with the Schedule E in 2020, and it shows it on 2020, I'm using the Schedule E. If you, if the property was not in service in 2020, we're in 2021 right now, get me a lease agreement. And that's all I'm using. 75% of that, I can only use it to offset the principal interest tax insurance HOA dues. Pity me payment. Pity me. Pity me, the fool. <laughs> Going out through here, it's a tax returns, Schedule E. So if you're looking at self-employed, or I'm um, sorry, we're still in re the uh, rental income. For, for the entire tax year, rental income must be averaged over 12 months. If you had 2020 tax returns, we're just going to use that divided by 12. There's certain ways that we can calculate. We can add back your interest on your mortgage, your taxes, if they're included in your mortgage. If they're not, I can't add that back. We'll let the loan officer do that calculation, but we're going to use your Schedule E. And then you also have to get a rental market, ana uh, market rental analysis, Form 2007 or 1025, one of those. Basically, you'll have your lease agreement. You'll have that rental analysis. And the lesser of whatever that rental analysis comes back, if you have $2,000 in monthly rental income on your lease agreement and the rental analysis comes back at $1,950, it's 75% of 1950 not the $2,000. If it's less than one year or if it's in the current, you're in the current year is when you started leasing it out. Offsetting monthly obligations for rental income. Again, it's only the... P-I-T-I-A, you can also, if it's in a business, you can also use that as well to take away. And that can count as rental income for you as well to offset just that payment. Other sources of income, feel free to browse through these. Alimony, child support. I've never done an automobile allowance. I'm sure someone has. That's not, not very common. Again, we kind of address foreign income a little bit. There are some instances you could use foster care income, dividend income is not too common, but that one I've done before, that's a pretty, that could be somewhat standard. A lot of us receive dividends in some sort. I don't receive much. I have my Acorns account. <laughs> I received a 77 cents last month, but just something to consider. Feel free to browse through those. I'm not going to get too much into those. Um, you can look at as far as what sort of documentation that's more just kind of document chasing at that point. It's already written down. One thing that's really cool, you can actually buy a home and have an offer letter for employment within 90 days of the note date, date that you sign that note, the date that you close with the 90 days. If the lender is willing to typically if the lender will is willing to service a loan for at least three to four months. So you can ask the lender, do you service your loans for at least three to six months from when you close? If so, they're probably going to be the one that will let you close the loan 90 days prior to when you start your employment. 
but you can't have any contingencies on there and you need to have the reserve payments from when you close all the way through the day that you start, start your employment. So typically you're going to see four to six months that they're going to want. Fanny does want more in that four to six range. Freddie actually wants a little bit less, but you're gonna look four to six months. If you have an hourly contract, that's not gonna work. You have to you have to get a proof of pay stub to show that you work 40 hours a week. All right, moving through, getting close. Come a long way, people. I know guidelines are not the most fun, but this is information that you need to know if you're going to buy a home, if you're going to refinance. Self-employed, you have to have 25% or greater ownership interest in the company. If you're filing a Schedule C, you have 100%. If it's an S Corp, you have 100%. Uh, this is more for like the partnership returns. If you had 10 or 15, I can't count that income. You gotta look at stability of income, the length of self-employment. I'm not gonna say no, but I've never heard of anyone approving someone self-employed without having at least two years of self-employed provable income. Not two years of tax returns, two years of, of provable, like I've been in business. There are There is a program through Freddie, which we'll get into next, next time, who does allow you to use one year if you've been established for, if you've been filing taxes for five years been in business five years or longer. Need those federal tax returns. Need your bank statements for the past three months. Sometimes we have to do, from your business assets, we have to do a cash flow analysis. So that's why we get the past three months. Make sure you're not trending down profit and loss statement for the current year. Need to show all those things. A little bit more in depth, but self-employed is actually really easy. A lot of loan officers are scared of it. They like to stick to that W-2 easy Let's get through the day, no, no hassle. But I'm telling you what, self-employed income is actually very fun to calculate. Put you on a little whirlwind if you're more of the analytical type like me. Especially if you have a self-employed income and you pay yourself a salary, bam, I get to use that, that's fun. Love seeing a loss and then seeing a $200,000 salary paid to yourself. And then, oh look, I get to count 150K, beautiful. Looks like we're doing a loan. All right, moving on through here. Nothing really more else to the self-employment. Got that one pretty good to go. This section, if you want to browse through it, B3, 3.5, D, requirements for income assessment. If you want to go browse through those on your own, you can kind of see some cool little general, general ideas, but these aren't these are more for the lender. Um, not a lot of this is for you as a, as a borrower. We're not going to go through asset assessment. Just give me your bank statements. Reserves. If you need reserves, what are good reserves? Has to be liquid. Need to have it in a secured account, like checking, savings, bond, box. Why do I say, I want to say box, no bonds. You need to be able to actually withdraw the funds. 401k, IRA. Make sure you can withdraw those through a hardship. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes you don't if you're strong enough on the, on the requirements. Ooh, screen almost went away. Depository accounts. Those are really simple. Again, you can use business accounts as well. Just don't. Don't transfer funds back and forth all the time. I actually do it myself, but if you're going to buy a home, stop transferring funds about two months before. Just stop it. Don't do it. Personal gifts. Awesome. Personal gifts. A lot of people hate getting gift funds. Key thing, as long as it's a family member, you're good. If it's a a boyfriend or girlfriend that you've had a strong, deep relationship with and, you're, and they're going on title, that's an acceptable one. 
kind of use common sense there. Like we're probably like at this point, we've been together seven years, probably going to get married or something in the near future. That's acceptable. Relative. So gift can be provided by a relative, defined by our spouse, legal guardianship, marriage, adoption, blood, fiance, fiance, domestic partner. It's usually how they classify it. If you're a boyfriend, girlfriend in deep relationship, I mean, you may not have affiliation with a builder, developer, real estate agent, any other interested party in the transaction to, uh, for them to be the donor. Donor of a gift of equity is not considered an interested party to the transaction. So if your parents are giving you a gift of equity, that money can be used for the entire down payment. So if, a, if your donor wants to give you a gift, they can give you the entire gift can be for the down payment, the entire down payment you need. Gift of equity, only key thing there is that if you're giving a gift of equity, just know you have to structure it properly. You want to make sure that you're doing it to where typically a, if you're buying a home from a family member, then what's actually happening is they're going to nine times out of 10 sell you the property for way less or at least less than what the home's worth. And so they want X amount out of that property. So a gift of equity is okay, but you want to structure it to the max appraised value that you can do and then actually take it all the way, take the loan as far down as possible and structure it in a way where they're getting what they want, but you don't have to pay mortgage insurance. That's a common one. Not having to bring any money to the table and not have to pay mortgage insurance. I have one of those going on right now. That is amazing. Holy moly. A lot of people don't realize that you can do that or just get, get a gift from grandma, dad, mom, give you a gift. Come on, parents, show me the money. You can get employer assistance. Just know your earnest money deposit. If you don't know what that is, that's money you put down as, hey, I'm buying a home. I'm serious about this. That comes off of what you bring cash to close. It's just like upfront money. Cash deposit on sales contract, gifts and grants. You can get a, there's down payment assistance for some of these. Credit assessments, minimum credit scores, you're gonna see 620. But really you wanna be at least 640. I'll be honest, it's pretty hard to get a 620 done. You better have a lot of money. You better have a lot, like a very strong compensating factors to get that one done. Usually revolves around money and doing a 15 or 20 year loan. So your debt to income better be low, 20%, 25. 20% down, another 20% in the bank. Clearly, like you can afford it. That's usually where they're like, okay, we'll buy your loan. A lot of this is again more more lender based. Nothing key for you that you're gonna find. Traditional credit history, mortgage payment history, just make sure you have good payment history on time. There are certain instances where you can have one to two lates um, if you're doing a rate and term refinance. Even some, some other programs will allow it, just kind of depends. Authorized user accounts can be removed. If you have an account that's going to be paid off within 12 months, Fannie Mae immediately excludes that. Significant derogatory credit events, waiting, reestablishing. There's different periods here. Feel free to browse through those. Chapter seven is four years from discharge date. Chapter 11 is for your business. I've never seen anyone to chapter 11, chapter 13. Um, that's typically four years. Let's go to that one. Four years, four year, chapter Seven, you'll see right there, four year, multiple bankruptcies, seven, foreclosure, seven. Here's a whole list. Feel free to take a look, screenshot it. Around page 479, gone through a lot here. Almost to the end of your section, might actually be there. Credit report analysis, that's not really something you're gonna have to have much concern there. 
If you have any questions, comments, any of this stuff, drop it down, comment section, so I can go ahead and answer those for you. Non-traditional credit history. There are certain instances where you have like some sort of non-traditional history. Um, again, that's more of a subject to the situation. There's a lot of guidelines that are just kind of subject to the situation. That once you review it, then you know if you can or can't do it. A lot of it has to get sent to underwriting for them to review. You want that done up front. Um, liability assessment. Again, that's not something we're going to really worry about here. Um, nothing that is going to affect you. Housing expense for the subject property. I mean, you just want to make sure that your monthly... I mean, I wouldn't go off just the general. I tell people don't go off of like, yes, you're technically qualified, but... If you can't afford it, you do your budget. You can't afford that monthly payment. Don't do it. Don't 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 buy a home like people are in this market to just get into a home. There's tons of buyers, little amount of homes. But if we have a, a lot of homes, then you can work out a good deal. Tons of other obligations. If you do pay alimony, child support, separate maintenance, you have bridge, swing loans, all sorts, debts paid by other lenders. I mean, debts paid by others. All sorts of things here student loans it's one percent or this would be the last thing that we're gonna go over here student loans this is very very cool so if you have like I have a lot of doctors and nurses or they have a lot of debt and they're in their residency still or they're just getting out of it you don't need to do one of those terrible doctor loans doctor loans are not bad they don't have mortgage insurance you can do zero percent down some, most will require 10 to 15, but this program allows you to do a standard mortgage, at least a half percent, if not almost a full percent better than all the doctor programs out there. I haven't found one doctor program that was within less than 0.5% on the interest rate. Buy out mortgage insurance if you have to. If you have a student obligated, um, I'm sorry, pay as you go or income based repayment plan, we could use that amount. If you don't have one, get on one. If you can't get on one because you make too much, we have to use 1%. But if, if you can get on an income driven repayment plan and that's $0, I'm using $0. That's huge. And we'll get into Freddie next week, but Freddie allows 0.5%. They don't allow the income driven repayment plan, but it's 0.5%. So if you're not, Freddie's typically the way to go. Um, or if you can't, then you would typically go Freddie. That would be the other route for you. Well, folks, that's about all the information that you're going to get regarding Fannie Mae. The rest of this is from underwriting properties. You have appraisal requirements, project standards. Don't worry about it. Townhomes, the only key thing there, a townhome classifies as a standard, regular, single family property. You don't have to worry about a lot of condo jargon or uh, approvals that you still need for conventional. Um, making sure that the insurance is good. Um, I'd say probably about 70% of a Condos get approved, about 30% don't because the insurance requirements aren't there per Fannie Mae guidelines. But you can do a townhome, no problem. No problem. It could be inside of the condo community. A lot of people don't know. There's actually someone at Quicken Loans. It's a different program. But they were looking at the property, which is in a condo community, but it had a section branched off. I took the Google, Google Maps all the way through. Guess what? It's in the townhome section. This little section, it's a townhome. Much better loan. Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, USDA, hands down. Way better loan. Well, thank you for tuning in to Fannie Mae. Isn't she wonderful, folks? She's the girl. Next week, we'll get to a boy. Having my baby girl actually in September. Very excited about that. I was born to be a dad. I'm gonna be so pumped. 
But thank you for tuning in. This is awesome. I hope that you left here more educated, not so snoozy and bored. But it was great being able to speak with you and get this going. I look forward to speaking to you guys next week. It's actually every two weeks. But thank you for tuning in. Hope you were educated, happy, and you know more today about Fannie Mae loans than you did before. Awesome. Thank you guys. Hope you have a wonderful day.